everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Ebert. I'm a site reliability engineer here at Honeycomb. Uh, and today I'm talking to you about how Honeycomb incidents, and I'm using here the term incident as a verb because this is something we do actively during and between outages. Uh, this section is broken out in two sections. Uh, this presentation is broken down in two sections. First one being how an incident unfolds, uh, and the second one being how we ensure that our tools are used effectively uh, with the incidents. So how an incident unfolds is a kind of generic thing. There's no recipe to that, uh, but since joining a company, I've seen patterns that repeat over and over again, and that I think are going to be shared with uh, a lot of different places and areas and how things go. So all the incidents that we have sort of start with an alert. Uh, internally, we use both the SLOs and triggers features of the platform uh, to do that stuff, to get told when something goes wrong. Um, there's odd things out like that sometimes come from customers, from the pollinators channels, from customer success, but most of them, uh, we try to carry everything we need to have from both the SLOs and triggers. Uh, Whatever alert we get in is something that we consider to be the entry point of the incident, right? There shouldn't be a need to get into a different dashboard page or something like that. The moment we get the incident, we can click on the link and we get into uh, the data that lets us figure out what might be going on. Uh, to do that, we use SLOs really for the success rates and performance values. Is something working or not going? It's what we use to... Uh, represent a proxy of our users' uh, experience and satisfaction. Uh, the triggers we use for different types of alerting, usually something like thresholds, uh, that could be the connections to a database. If you have 500 of them, uh, you wanna know at 400 of them that you have to take some kind of action, change the system, how it works, before you reach that threshold where everything decompensates and starts breaking very violently. So SLOs are not great for these. You want to know before there's a problem. Uh, triggers are great for that. Another one for that is going to be non-events. Uh, the SLOs that we have are based on the SLIs. There's a success, there's a failure. A non-event is something that won't be there, right? If you stop receiving any kind of traffic, there's nothing in an SLO that looks for a successful query that's going to tell you it's not there. So we use the SLOs for the end user satisfaction, but the triggers for this kind of operational view as people maintaining a platform to know how it works. Uh, we also have uh, third party providers that we use for a few things. We use Sentry for assertions, uh, stack traces and stuff like that. And while we're developing the OTLP metrics and point of things, we still uh, use and already have established uh, metrics providers for some components that don't give us um, the rich events we would like to have, for example, with Kafka. So the alert is the beginning of the workflow. Uh, the thing that happens right after you get that is you get on Slack. Um, one of the key parts of what makes a distinction between something there is a near incident or an outage is going to be uh, whether it happens during hours, business hours or off hours, right? Something that's off hours is always more exhausting. You're going to be slower, it's going to be riskier, and you're going to have far fewer resources available, usually other people, to help you with things. So they come with more context switching, more tiredness and all of that. Uh, in general, everyone will try to increase the autonomy of the operators you have so that more people can go it alone, right? Uh, that one person can handle all kinds of incidents all the time. Uh, but really, the other thing we have to admit is that our systems are too large for one person to know everything about them. And relying on each other is the basic concept that we can't hope to get rid of. And instead, we need to optimize, right? We need to optimize for the better social aspects of things so that incidents unfold better. So for us, a big part of that is to get into Slack. We have an ops channel for people and an alerts channel for all the alarms and stuff like that. And we try really, really hard not to post in the alert stuff and only post in the ops stuff. Uh, and we have this sort of escalation where the non-urgent stuff is just a notification. The really urgent stuff is a notification on Slack on top of a pager duty call that we have. Um, most of the time, there's always people hanging in the ops channel. They're almost or always willing to help, uh, especially since we're a distributed company, there's people in many time zones. Um, and we have some things that you can see here uh, on the slide where Ben is talking to someone with the Eng on-call uh, account, which is dynamically set every week to match the people on one of our three call rotations. 
Um, we have one for the platform, one for the product, um, meaning product engineers, and one for the uh, integrations, telemetry, the tooling that is a bit more external. And every time we ping someone with that alias, uh, all three people on call get the instant notification on that one. And for us, part of that is that escalation is always acceptable, right? If there's this idea that the system is too complex to understand, there's this acceptance or acceptation that really uh, you're going to have to escalate. It's kind of normal. More eyes mean that you get a more diverse approach. You might get better and quicker resolution. And if things you know, need more coordination, you find out that you start alone, you uh, rope in someone to help you, and then there's a need to get a higher uh, density conversation, something like that. We start a video chat, usually with Zoom, uh, and then talk about it directly. But all the key uh, elements, whether they're events or reporting, uh, or actions that were taken are reported back on Slack so that people looking on the sidelines can get up to speed without interrupting anyone, but also because it helps the investigations that we can have after the fact. And we can see another practice that's interesting that Ian is doing here, which is just let me know if you need more eyes on this. Like there's this awareness that there's multiple people working on the team uh, on, on the issue. And if there's any kind of cause for concern or need for more hands, someone is staying on the sidelines, not getting involved for no reason, but they are making it known that they are available. And that tends to be very, very helpful to have and to know about. Uh, then comes the section of figuring out, you know, what are the symptoms? What is going on right now? What's the problem? There is frankly no one size fits all solution for this. Uh, people will go from whatever hypothesis they have at the time and dig from there. Whatever seems the most likely before the incidents even unfolds and even before there's an understanding is going to orient the investigation. And usually, you know, the frequent one is, oh, we had a bad deploy. Let's roll it back. And sometimes that won't work. Sometimes it will. Uh, something may have changed, accumulated. And if you're lucky, it's that simple. You roll it back and that's it. In general, we rely heavily on something like bubble up, which we have on each of the SLO pages. Uh, to guide us through this sort of investigation. They do the quick discrimination early on of what is likely, what is unlikely, uh, and it narrows the space down as tightly as possible early on. And that can drastically reduce the response time that you have um, and something that is not in all the SLs offering that you have there. Uh, I'm recently new on this team. I joined less than six months ago. And the closest experience I can relate to uh, was absolutely slow. Uh, and here things are a ton faster and nicer. And what I can probably say is that uh, it's one of the few ways here where I've been able to be productive on call without even having to read and understand the code. Um, I was able to reverse engineer, create understanding of how things work or not based purely on the observations of the data that we have. Um, which is something that as good as I've been at handling dashboards would never happen that rapidly uh, and, and with that amount of fidelity in what we have. But sometimes what we have is something that looks like, you know, a user is abusing the system uh, because the correlation is high and, you know, the people seeing the problems are the people actively using the product a whole lot. And that can happen as well if your feature usage is asymmetric. Like 90% of people use one feature, 10% of people use another feature, then it looks like the problem with that feature is this user. And that turns out to really, really be a sort of problem. And um, really this dynamic of the things that you can observe but can't explain right away is where it makes sense to require judgment and skill. It's not something that you can just automate a way that a correlation engine or something with AI could figure out easily uh, because a correlation is going to be extremely solid, but not necessarily meaningful. Uh, so whenever folks reach their limits in what they understand and do their spelunking, uh, we sort of revert to doing uh, analysis from the ground up, whether it is from the code or whether it is by SSHing into a server and figuring out what is happening. Right. So to Put it another way, people are going to use the thing they believe is useful. Um, and it doesn't make sense for us, for example, to keep ourselves outside of SSH just because we should be using Hanako. Uh, the thing we try to do is that we make extensive usage of it for business intelligence and our operations. Uh, but we know and admit that we're going to meet an, our match at some point where we need a different perspective that it's not being covered. And the thing we try to do is to feed that information back into the platform because these advantages of being tied to the alerting, the reporting, the first view we get in the incident turn out to pay dividends over time. 
So we know we're going to have to break out of it at some point in time, but it's always uh, an important step in the post-incident process to actually feed that back into the platform, uh, both as we dog food for everyone using it, but also for our own effectiveness of response. Then the fourth step is going to be catalyzing the patient, right? This is where the tools help a bit less, or at least the observability tools, right? Something like strong CI, strong CD, the ability to deploy rapidly uh, are going to be helpful there. Um, but really, once we identified the sort of things that's going wrong, the question becomes, what actions can we take to bring balance back to things? Is there going to be a need for a more permanent solution? If so, how can we keep the things uh, afloat until then, right? If your ship has hull damage, you got to work the pumps until you make it to port. You can't fix everything live. Some of them you have to only make do with it until you get into a more stable area. And this becomes a game for the adepts, the people you have in your team who understand how to bend the system in and out of shape to keep it on target. It's possible that you're going to have to trade safety and reliability in one component to help another one. Uh, there's going to be a need for compensation across them in multiple places. You share the burdens and stuff like that. And so we've had cases where we had to drop data retention. We wanted to have two days in case another component was being uh, corrupting data. And we dropped that to, uh, I believe, below 12 hours so that we could extend the disk space because there was consuming problems somewhere else. So uh, there's a need to understand this idea that you have this spare capacity in one place. You can tune it out. It's going to help something else. We have that as well in some places where we uh, do calculations or analysis and we can lower the accuracy to make it cheaper to do. Uh, you can pay for extra capacity by bringing up bigger instances or more of them until some behavior normalizes. Uh, there are feature flags that let you turn in or out of some features that might be costlier or have different trade-offs and correctness and everything like that. So really, uh, this is where you need to have that sort of good awareness of how things work to be able to do something. You can find the issue rapidly. Solving them requires this sort of expertise most of the time. Um, and sometimes you'll be in a situation where a proper fix would take you three or four hours, but you have only 30 minutes before everything collapses. And this is where these trade-offs become extremely useful. Because if you have a peak use period, you can delay it by eight times, gain you a lot of time. And if it's only a problem at a peak time in a day, then being able to defer the work uh, and survive one peak can buy you like an entire day of work. And if you can repeat it the day after that, then you can buy weeks of work to actually fix the underlying issue if it's not something that can be done rapidly. Uh, and, and those are going some of the things that, you know, let us turn uh, a near incident and prevent it from turning into a full-blown outage. I think internally we have a count of something like 10 near incidents for every outage we have, and that's probably where a lot of that comes from. And then you have to fix the issue. And you know, fixing the issue is sort of simple enough. Uh, you change the code, you do something like that. It's not something that tools help a lot. By this point, you've understood most of everything. And usually it's rather straightforward. Before you even get to an incident review, your engineers usually already have an idea of how to fix the one very specific case of a problem they had. Um, and if your incident review is kind of one of the milk kind of thing, this is what is going to get repeated. It was already decided before everyone even joined. It's part of incident handling. It requires involvement from engineers who know the stack. It's generally either straightforward, done right away. Um, uh, but if you move and only care about really the small fixes, uh, your work is done. If you want to have the biggest work that has to do with the organization and everything, it might just be uh, beginning at this point. So all of these operations that I've just seen, um, are usually worth optimizing on their own. Uh, on, on the other end, you can't really force a flower to bloom, right? You have to only hope to give it all the best conditions for it to grow well. And so while it's true that having the best tools can give the best results, their effectiveness is mostly defined by the work you do before and after the incident. Uh, another analogy I love for that is to compare things to uh, competitive sports. Right. Of course, it's going to be during the competition itself that things matter the most. This is where you absolutely have to deliver. But it's all the work done outside of the competition that tends to define how well the event unfolds. Right. The training, the preparation, the resting that you do, all of that stuff has an impact in how the actual high stakes event unfolds. So the basic mindset that I think everyone needs to have around that is that incidents are normal in systems and they must be treated as opportunities to reevaluate our model of our own organization. 
uh, the small failures or vulnerabilities are present in the organization or operational system long before an incident is triggered. So the causes behind an error and an incident are not something you discover. They're something we construct and interpret from uh, what was already in place and already happening. So reliability is not something you have. It's something you do. Adaptability is the same. So the changes that we have don't cause outages. They highlight existing misalignments between how we imagine things to be and how they turn out to actually be. And the changes are only a light you shine on these cracks. They are not the cause themselves. They're just how you discover them. So you will not get good results if the, th the thing you try to do is prevent all the incidents because by definition, they are unplanned. Uh, they already happen by surprise. Some of the best work we can do in that case is to turn things around and focus on adapting to this misalignment rather than trying to prevent it entirely. Or in some cases, highlighting the misalignment becomes it before, before it becomes a big problem. So once we admit that the, the incidents are going to happen and can't be prevented at all, or not all of them at the very least, uh, we must do work explicitly to support the high stakes, high stress situations that come out of these events. Um, one of the really, really basic thing is asking a question, how do you prepare, prepare people for surprise? And one of the things to do is to give them enough of a broad understanding of the things that are in the system, right? And to keep it up to date, that it's possible for them to reason about new things they haven't seen before without feeling completely lost. And it is, this is done on people having a mental model of the things and keeping that mental model up to date. Uh, so one of the things you want to do is to provide information at the source, not interpretations. Right? That means you want to expose the data that has to do with something that happened, not necessarily the cause or what might be wrong in the component. I don't want the routing component to tell me why it thinks something is going wrong in another part of the system. I want it to give me information. Uh, what you do in doing that is that you provide context and your people and your operators interpret and frame the context uh, in the richer capa capability that they have compared to any components we've programmed. Uh, one thing you can do is to try and align the structure of your observability with the product and not the implementation. And what I mean by this is that it's really, really cool when we can turn out something like open telemetry and all of a sudden we get metrics and traces about everything. Uh, but a lot of these are going to be focused on the idea of what the code is doing. And they are going to make the most sense when you have the code open on the side and can read everything that's going on and trace it through. If you invest in doing some sort of uh, manual instrumentations that ties uh, the event flows that you have with what your product represents, then understanding the products instantly guides you into better understanding all the observability that you have and ties in the code related stuff into a richer context that lets people form a mental model from the understanding they already have of your product. So this is the difference between data availability and observability. Observability caters to the requirement of making predictions and understanding what's, go what's going on, whereas data availability is just having a numbers out there. Um, so you, I think aligning on the structure of your product tends to help a lot because usually there's already a lot of things about uh, onboarding people on that. Then you have to encourage organizational awareness. Sometimes you will solve incidents because you know something changed recently, or you have an idea of who knows what in the system and who to ask questions to. So uh, demos, demo days, incident reviews, uh, onboarding people with architecture sessions and reviews, and all that kind of stuff, having discussions in general where you can compare and contrast your mental models uh, are going to be really, really good at creating that organizational awareness. You want to make it safe to ask questions, both through your tools, meaning that you don't want the exploration to be costly. You don't want to make a query to something and know it's going to cost you a lot of money or stall the work of other people. You want to be able to uh, conceptually have the cost so low that you can ask as many questions as you want and get good signal back. And for people, it's a kind of same thing, right? You want the psychological safety to be able to ask questions to people, to get explanations, and to do it in a way that doesn't have dire consequences to you. You don't want to be in a situation where asking the wrong questions with the wrong person about the system that we're maintaining lands them into trouble. This is going to create all sorts of isolation and erode the trust structure that you have that makes good incident response possible. For alerting, there's something really, really interesting about that one. We're using service level objectives uh, where the thing we want to do 
is to have the fewest amount of SLOs possible because they're comparing user journeys. We have something like bubble up. So if we can have like three alerts that cover 80% of the platform, then we know that our alerting is always going to be uh, as clear and as with as little noise as possible. On the other hand, when you do a call rotation, you tend to structure it around uh, who knows what, uh, who has the expertise to run the thing as fast as possible. And if you page the right person, you get the faster response. And these two things are in conflict with each other. Uh, because usually the service level objective means, you know, if you have only three SLOs for your entire company, which is not the case for us, we have about 50. Uh, but if you have only three of them, but you have 10,000 people on call, then you need to be extremely accurate to uh, page the right person in all of that. So Honeycomb is sort of lucky that we're still small enough. Uh, we have this three team rotation that I've mentioned earlier. Um, and so we're able to get away with a few SLOs that cover a lot and have the general expectation that people can handle most of everything and are safe to escalate. Otherwise, it's serving us well. Um, but a much, much bigger company is going to run into that problem with uh, a, a bit more pain. And so the, the few options that we have in this case are going to be some things like, one, um, redefine what the users of a shared components are to mean other engineering teams. If I'm maintaining a database, then my users are going to be the teams that rely on the database to be there to work well. And so that can create this sort of proliferation of SLOs based on uh, domain specific requirements that we have in the technical stack. Um, Another one is to change the call rotations to cover broader bases in a single team. If you've got a call graph of something like 15 services to do something, it might make sense for some of these 15 services to share a call rotation, knowing full well that the person being paged might have to escalate from time to time. It's going to give them a bit of a break. It's going to require these social changes about being safer and doing the escalations. Uh, but having fewer SLOs tends to mean that if one of the shared components kind of goes haywire, you page a lot fewer people as well. So it's that tension between uh, how many people you page and how often you page, essentially. Um, there are ways as well to do higher level analysis, which is not in our product today, uh, where you could decide, for example, that if you see a burn alert, something like Bubble Up already runs on them and you redistributes a page to someone else. I don't know who, if anyone does that. I figure that the very, very large corporations often don't have a choice to do something like that. Um, I, I've seen stuff about multiple alerts management where it mutes some of them, groups them and stuff like that. At some point, if you're too large to get good signal to noise, you have to sort of alert based on which alerts you see. And that creates a step in there, adds a bit of latency, but helps you keep the signal. But really keeping these two conceptually disjoints between what you alert on and your call rotations as two things that are in a state of tension, I think is a good thing because it keeps, it lets you keep in mind really the um, risk between the uh, high coverage, high signal, low disruption, and the hygiene you have to have around the alerting. Um, and then finally, the thing you have is to keep the operators going, to reuse the analogy with the sports things, right? If you work your uh, athletes so much that they're always injured, you're not going to get good results. So some of the, th the things we do is take time off after off hour incidents. You have to rest. You've worked at night or something like that, but you don't have to work uh, for the day or part of the day that follows that. Um, we want to carry context through on-call handoffs between the rotations where we mention what happened, what was challenging. We test that our alerting and escalation policies are still in place. Uh, and that's this little bit of a ritual to hand things off from one to the other. And so the context is not lost between each rotation. You want to keep a tempo, right? Too many incidents and you exhaust your people, but too few of them and you run out of practice. You get rusty. You're bent out of shape. It's not going to go super well. So if you don't have enough incidents, uh, good for you, but you should think about uh, things like simulator hours, game days, uh, chaos engineering, these kinds of things where you create these controlled experiments where people can still practice the procedures that happen rarely because they're super reliable or because you've been lucky lately. Uh, you should not treat on-call or incident related tasks as sadly necessary. Uh, these should be opportunities for gaining better insights. Um, they're a good role to have if you treat them like uh, 
punishment, it's going to be conceptualized as such and it's not going to be valued properly. You should be ready to renegotiate your SLOs according to the current capacity that you have. If you're in a situation where you can't promise what you want to deliver, working people longer hours is not going to fix that. Sometimes you have to take a break in order to do more again, and the SLO should be negotiable and adjusted uh, as people see fit. Right? They are ideally a discussion tool to prioritize various types of works in your organization, not a contractual obligation. And finally, blame awareness is important. Uh, the incidents are often the consequences of our organizational structures and shifts that happen over time. The people handling the incidents are those coping with the end results of weeks, months, or even years of upstream work. Uh, they were the most visible part of it, but the incidents are to be organizationally owned. Uh, and there's nothing, uh, I, I would say, more saddening than blaming an employee for not following procedures when the employee is usually breaking the procedures to save things that the procedures don't count, for example. So this blame awareness has to be uh, front of mind in everything that we do. And incidents are to be owned by the organization, not just the people who try to solve them actively. This is it for me. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk. Fred, that was really cool. I never thought I would say that incident reviews are one of the most interesting things to me, but uh, at Honeycomb, that's the case. Yeah, I enjoyed them a whole lot, even if I didn't necessarily give a huge part of incident reviews uh, in the presentation itself. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, Nora Jones said something that was really interesting to me. Uh, she said, stories are everything. They're how folks get better and actually learn the history. It takes time to get good at storytelling uh, about incidents. Uh, how does the storytelling happen at Honeycomb? What are tools and practices that you use to teach or socialize or um, re reinforce it? All right, there, there's two dimensions to that one. The first one I would say is during the incident review itself. Uh, yesterday, we linked into the kind of timelines that uh, we show when we build the incidents. And in that case, this is an interesting one to give that perspective of what has been going on and getting back into the present tense and figuring out like there's a whole of 30 minutes where we don't know what is going on. What were the struggles at that point, right? It's kind of the hero's journey and putting you back into the perspective you had back then um, helps you have these better discussions. The other part of the story then is dissemination in terms of what you tell to other people in the organization who were not there for the review, not there for the incident. Um, and we're still experimenting with that one, whether it's uh, presentations in engineering all hands about the sort of operational story we've been having or having a written report about that. But we're actively experimenting with ways in which we can take the learnings we had in these perspectives and share them as effectively as possible, both in terms of time, but also attention and requirements that we have there. Yeah, really, really cool. I'm, I'm always very excited to see that. I've never seen something like that before. Um, very neat. Um, I really liked also how you, so you have so many great uh, metaphors in your talk, but one that keeps standing out to me is where you say that um, it's about kind of bending the system and having the knowledge and experience and I guess context to bend the system out of shape to get to safety. Um, I don't know that I have a question around this, but I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about that sort of mindset. Right, yeah. Uh, there's always this idea that we have a given amount of capacity to do something, whether it's in knowledge and energy and stuff like that. And there are common patterns of what people do under pressure. And some of them are going to be like drop accuracy, drop some tasks, uh, focus differently in some of them. And knowing the systems and how it works, um, it's really being able to do that trade-off and knowing some components enough to, you know, tweak the dials and turn the knobs in the ways that lets you get more of the system given the current pressure, which is not usual because you're already in an incident and knowing how to do that. And this is the part in a social technical system where the technical aspect is usually fixed, configurable, but picking the right set of presets and everything uh, is dynamic adjustment by the humans who can understand the direction things are going in a way that you don't see in just the numbers. There has to be anticipation uh, and, and a sense of direction things are going into and acting on these. And, yeah. and that's why the human aspect is so important, making technical system works. Absolutely. Um, I think there's there's so much in what you said too about like trust and team that really, really uh, is compelling there. Um, Cool. Fred, thank you so much. That was wonderful. All right. Thanks. Thanks.